Well, hello, good evening, and welcome from wherever you are tonight to the virtual Norwich Bookstore. Um, it looks like we've got a crowd from all over the country, maybe even all over the world tonight, and we're very excited to have you all joining us. For those who aren't familiar with our store, we are the Norwich Bookstore in Norwich, Vermont. We're in the Upper Valley uh, near Dartmouth College. Um, near where the King Arthur Baking Company is. And if you are not from our area, we hope that someday you'll come and pay us a visit. My name is Sam. I am one of the co-owners of the Norwich Bookstore. And I am delighted to be here with Four Way Books tonight, a press we've long admired and a press that is close to, close to us in terms of age. It's followed a similar tra trajectory, Four Way Books was founded in 1993 and then Norwich Bookstore in 1994. So we've kind of followed similar literary trajectories here on the East Coast and uh, we're very excited to be meeting with them tonight and meeting with these wonderful writers. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. First of all, we have books from all three of these great writers available tonight via our website. Some of you have already purchased your books. Thank you very much. We've been sending books all over the country and uh, we're delighted to do so. If you would like to purchase copies of any of these authors' new or recent books, please go ahead and uh, pick them up. I'm gonna drop links in the chat after we get started. You can order from the Norwich Bookstore. We can ship anywhere in the country. If you are here in the Upper Valley, we can make those books available for pickup for you. So thank you. We appreciate it. Your purchase supports independent presses. It supports these authors and it supports the Norwich Bookstore. And we are grateful. Now, tonight uh, we are going to read in alphabetical order by last name, we decided, so I will introduce each author as they come up. Uh, each author will read, will go for about 45 minutes um, to an hour, somewhere in there. And then anytime we have left over, we will uh, answer some questions as well. So if you have questions, you could drop them in the Q&A or in the chat. And at the end of the event, we'll get to as many as we can. Now, if you enjoy this event and want to know more about what's going on at the Norwich Bookstore, uh, we host a large selection of author events throughout the year. Most of them right now are virtual. Many of them are free and open to the public. There's sure to be something else that you will enjoy. So check it out. Our website is norwichbookstore.com. I'll put that in the chat. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. We're at Norwich Bookstore on most major platforms. You can sign up for our email newsletter. And no matter where you're coming from, we hope that you will follow along with us and join us for another author event. Now, again, tonight we are here with Four Way Books. They are a literary publisher based in New York City. They are a nonprofit publisher. They started in 1993. And since then, they've been putting out about 16 to 18 books a year, uh, a mixture of established, really well-known authors and new voices. And many of those new voices, if you look it up, have become the established voices of a few years down the road, have been award winners, have been widely anthologized. They do really incredible work. And I think we'll see that reflected in tonight's reading. Uh, we have three wonderful writers joining us tonight. We've got Joan Houlihan, we've got Glenn Porcho from Galveston, Texas, and Cammie Thomas. And Joan and Cammie are, are nearby here. Uh, they are in Massachusetts. And so we're glad to have them as part of our New England literary family. And now without further ado, I'm gonna get this show on the road. We are gonna kick it off with Massachusetts poet Joan Houlihan, her new collection, It Isn't a Ghost If It Lives in Your Chest, is a collection that reflects on the persistence of loss and explores the accidental ruptures of trauma that allow re-entry into our world. It considers haunting encounters, those ruptures through which what is gone comes back, with the underlying premise that nothing ever truly goes away. The new collection, again, is It Isn't a Ghost If It Lives in Your Chest. Joan Houlihan is here to read with us. Please, from wherever you are, join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you, Joan, take it away. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everybody out there somewhere. Um, I'm gonna share my screen um, because Zoom allows you to, and I've always wanted the, um, the words to take center stage in reading. So this is my opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, so I'll be reading 
really straight through um, and there'll be a Q&A at the end. So if you want to talk to me about any of these poems, just make a note, you know, you'll see it. It's here, it won't disappear into the air. Um, and I'll start with some um, family poems. Um, it sounds warm and fuzzy, um, but it really isn't. Okay, the ax and hammer which come to be mother. Loud is the dark that comes over you to feed you, she forages here. Twigs break. She is near the old parts of earth, takes from its pressed down matter and makes an edible wafer. When the churches died out, she stayed. Her language busted with wrath. Small models took hold of her skin. Her body, a warthog, she wobbled. Truth in one hand, go to hell in the other. She brandished the axe of justice as she floated over the stumps. She brandished the hammer of damn it as we cowered in our beds. Her will made of pitch can't be read. The cartwheel. The sun has gone in. The world is feeding, cooing dove cooing owl. In the cooling light, I am strange to them. Every night I am carried to bed, light as unbaled hay. Every day at the root of the elm, my child seat waits in weeds. Chokewort, black mouth, bristle bore. Cloud bales load to the sky. Arms and legs, I'm spokes on a lawn, fresh cut. Which way am I turning? Which way am I facing? Ground, sky, ground. The next few poems are centered around, concerned with, mm, circle around environmental concerns. Um, and um, how we treat our animals as food and as, as captives to our affection. Topologically yours, this ground is heaving graves. What's underfoot has business here, but the whole landscape looks like trash. A body speaks to you from behind. I'm a bitter kind of happy. Bodies have feelings too. In its own head, it tried to be kind. Now it misses being killed. Soon you won't have any land, so storm over this one with long strides. Go higher. Echoes around the hills never stop. Take a lesson from that. No one can hear you. I hemorrhaged like a rose, fold after fold. Here comes another sunset. Don't lose your eyes to it. Blind trust. In the nod of a cow, stiff legged, as she leaps in the padlock, as she leaps in the paddock, drops to her knees, then back to roll on new grass. The large eye caresses yours. She smells you as you lead her through the shaded field. Hooded and without guile, follows you to the chute. You are the ignorance she lives through the heavy blade she hears sliding into the grooves. The secret brutalities will make patties from that on your behalf. A human fraternity carved out of a hung carcass. The damaged parrot. Slow as a child, unused to being out, she moved through worlds of trees and grass fell asleep in the sun while the other birds played. Woke in the dark and expelled her owner's words. Oh, snap, crap, baby want a bitch slap. Felt herself to be green, but never knew her head was red. Worked on finding food at night so no one could see. Peeling bark off trees, pecking at leaves. 
got the hang of seeds, went with the gang to neighborhood feeders, finally fitting in. Tomorrow she will come again and dawdling stand large among the chickadees, finally free of speech. Um, some more um, intimate poems, persona poems too. Um, this is called, I am a Switzerland. Father created an alp for me. He called it Petterhorn. It came out in the shape of a sugar cone, the top silvery white. Am I an heiress? Yes, to his hymn book with gilt edge, to his Bibles pressed to death pansies and moth, to these brass cufflinks and trouser hangers, to this sprung eros in my damask. What pink flesh you have, he'd observe as he stuffed an apple into a pig head and served it with both eyes open. He worked his own eyes from behind, a large contraption moving room to room, made like an icon by looking. Born into his country, I master him. My eyes, hands, and ears triumph. In winter, my alp is powdered with father, his head a silvery cloud. Couple poems. Bottle dungeon. We stood inside it looking up. The brow of the palm de os, its nasty heart-shaped padlocks cast from brass, filled with cuts and tetanus, rose over the same. Tourists stood another view, a tree that curled its bark, a promenade of small pillow dogs. Walkers with lion-headed walking sticks who waved silk scarves while they talked. Shall I reach over the rail for a fig, dear, or will it prove sour? What a beautiful silence we made, like the tower clocks stopped hands from which a man once hung. Account of a root rising improbable in pajamas, out at the elbows, ripped at the knees, mum to the bone, mouth ready. He still hasn't found a face. I called him a bum and I'm sorry. You look like a horse after mucking, I'd said. You look like a bleeding mouse. What shit, he cried from his top, hitched up his bottom and huffed. His symptom, tympanic, the drum, the drum. Then a shout from the bedroom, I'm under, I'm under. I pulled him out like a root. We set his place as before, the chair with arms for status, the wedding china, white and gold, geranium in the middle bowed, Billy's voice on the phonograph cracked. We hung his suit in the shape of him, placed his suitcase beside it. Where am I going again? Outside his tools lay rusted, reinventions of himself, a hazardous waste between mice and sky we had to pay to get rid of. Our story. I treat animal memory as the foundation of identity and you precious gelding, coat stroked to transparency, I see through your rampage, your lively horse laugh. How long can I lead you with such a worn halter? Once on a road that slants down just a little in the, confid in the confidence of a morning, we started out. Corpus glorification. In hospice, by moonlight, part of him crawls, nocturnal, cold. Through the smell of resin, the pine gods, solemn and tall. 
part of him speaks to himself. Lay yourself down in the ground, sir. Then comes floating a funeral, which never touches the ground. He stands to watch it go by. The evening is a room. Prepared and empty, he goes in. From the clock, he can hear a little death talk. Ghosts in profile, middle-aged and older, their bottom halves trailing off, walk into and out of the room, lonely and stray. He asks, how can I be standing here if I am in the ground? And the wall and the nurse and the clock all look and the moon waves from every window as they wrap him up from top to toe in a very fine veil. Custom. You on your last day bled like a sunset spread bright, a red rag over clouds. I touch the past like a chair. From custom I burn a candle. I have not found your face. The girl I left behind me for Lucy Rock Broido. The wind being motherless wraps the tree, troubles the window a little. My kittens circle, crouch, leap, couch to counter and back. And in the detritus of me, box to box to tiniest box, I unpack the single pussy willow, one paw tissued. In that velvet dark I moved through, lit low in spite of others, heat enough for me, enough for others to refrain from. I rub the amber leaf light from my last Christmas tree, take to the tub and marble surround to worship the waters, take to the bed heaped high and deep, my appetite, my appetite caged and cruelly tamed. Who will make me safe? Conspire in the lie of beauty, the lie of the body, unbreached. In the rush of tissue, new boots laced to my pace, cincture of suede at my waist, and my hair, my God, the waves of shook copper, shining a girl's will. How far I've come. And how do you like your hyacinth girl, the gone as smoke of me now? Um, and the last poem is called My Left Hand. Thanks everyone for listening and watching and looking at the poems. I want to stop thinking about where it goes, about when it will come back. I don't need you, I hiss to the dark. My right hand finds it, touches it. They have a language, a birthplace together. In the morning, I'm shown the mirror. I see it reflected and cry with relief. It comes to my face to wipe the tears. Thank you. Thank you for silence. Thank you for your silence. <laughs> Thank you, it's a Jill. funny, it's a funny uh, ending, but yeah. I, I see applause in the chat. Ah. Yes, the icons, the hand icons, yeah. Thank you so much, Joan. Yeah. Um, one of the great things about doing Zoom readings, though we miss in-person readings so much, we were just talking about this before we started the broadcast, was, is that we can have people join from all around. Geography means nothing to us anymore. And uh, that means we can have some really interesting and exciting readings. Um, and this brings us to our next guest, Gwen Porsche, who is not joining us from New England this evening. In fact, Glenn is joining us from Galveston, Texas, and we are so delighted that we were able to bring him virtually into uh, our corner of the world. And I think you're going to love listening to him read. Although the characters in Porsche's stories change face, Story to story, they all inhabit a world dominated by interior voices revealing fragmented selves. They find difficulty making their inner worlds with their competing narratives and emotions 
fit into the world surrounding them. And as they confront everyday predicaments and encounters, they are oftentimes averse to expressing their thoughts, thereby leading themselves deeper into a conflicted interior landscape. Glenn Porcho's new collection is Getaway, out now from Four Way Books, and we are delighted to have him here to read from it. Glenn Porcho, thank you for being here. Take it away. Thank you for having me. It's good to be heard. Uh, this is the second story in the collection, and it's called Faux Bois. I've been walking the sidewalks and alleys of our neighborhood for years and had gotten to know some of the neighbors this way. One of them, Olivia, an older woman who lived across the street and five or six houses down. I first spoke with her when she was planting clusters of periwinkles in her front beds. They loved the heat, she said. Sometime later, we struck up a conversation about our vegetable gardens and she led me to her backyard to see her tomatoes and bell peppers. We then sat in a shaded area on a weathered teak bench where she commented on the faux bois bird bath in front of us. She and her late husband had found it in an antiques market during a road trip and had driven it home with them. And though our talk turned to our favorite vegetables, my eyes lingered on the bird bath, on its nuance and texture. Olivia died of heart failure in her mid eighties, about a year after we sat on the bench. A for sale sign soon appeared in her yard and I assumed that like many aging homes in our neighborhood, it would be torn down by the new owners and replaced with some imposing two-story monument to affluence. But the house remained on the market for months and I watched the beds become overgrown and the grain wood fence surrounding the backyard sag. Several of its pickets rotting and cracking. And then one afternoon at the end of a long walk, I noticed that the for sale sign had at last been removed. There was no discernible activity at the house for some time, but I began to watch it closely after twice seeing a white pickup truck parked in front of it. While walking through Olivia's alley following the second pickup siding, I saw that her decrepit fence had been knocked down and hauled off and in its place stood a temporary fence. The bird bath and bench remained in place and I asked myself what would happen to them. The buyers would likely want to erase all signs of Olivia's life in the house. And I imagine they'd view the bench and bird bath as pieces to retire so they could put their own stamp on the property. Vance and I had lived in our house for 40 years, raising two children there and building our lives together. At times, I thought of our house being flattened by the next owner without the slightest regard for its history. Perhaps for that reason, as much as any other, I felt a desire to protect Olivia's property. And I could see only one way to act on that desire. On my walks and at home, I kept thinking of the bird bath as something that could be salvaged from the demolition and removal of what was left of her life. So I took it as providence when I saw an empty wagon near the garbage container behind Olivia's house as I walked her alley. I'd never seen the wagon before, but I guessed that the future residents had come across it and had put it out to be taken away by the city. I stared at the wagon for at least a minute while making up my mind, my pulse going wild as I picked up its handle and opened the gate. I pulled it toward the bird bath, alert for sound and movement in the yard. I worked the bird bath off its base and lifted the base into the wagon, telling myself not to appear rushed or to look around to see if anyone was watching. I rolled the wagon through the open gate. No one else I caught sight of in the alley and no one coming near me on the way home. I hid the base between our fence and the back of our garage and then drove our SUV to the alley to pick up the rest of the bird bath. I barely had enough strength to heave it over the bumper. The whole thing went off without any problem that I was aware of, though someone could have been watching from a window. I didn't tell Vance, unsure how to justify myself to him. 
I had a sense of accomplishment that I'd saved the bird bath and wagon and they were now mine. But in the heat of the transfer, I hadn't considered what I'd do with the bird bath when I got it home. I tried to put it in a mental box until a solution occurred to me, yet its presence nagged at my thoughts, along with the worry that I could have been seen taking it. Other reasons to worry emerged. I learned from a neighbor that Olivia's son, Newt, had bought her house. He was not going to tear it down, but renovate it and move in with his new wife. Newt, I feared, had to be familiar with the bird bath. He may have commented to his wife on the bird bath's disappearance and speculated that a workman had taken it, lamenting that he'd been deprived of this memory of his mother and father. My mind ran through the possibilities and various storylines unfurled to me in the middle of the night beyond my control. And if I took encountering the wagon as some sort of providence, how should I interpret the circumstance that Newt's daughter, Charlotte, and her family moved into the house directly across the street from ours? She had a husband who was a lawyer and two young children all of whom seemed delightful when I introduced myself to them. They too might recognize the bird bath if they saw it. And I thought it dangerous to fabricate a story that Olivia had given it to me when Newt could know for a fact that it had stood in her backyard for a long time after her death. Perhaps to compensate for my fear of what they might eventually think of me, I grew friendly with them, speaking with Charlotte and her son and daughter if they happened to be playing in the yard when I passed by. I don't know what got into me as I look back on it, but I started to think of Charlotte's kids playing with the wagon. They liked to spend time together outside and seeing them from a window on a cool weekend morning, I went out to the garage and uncovered the wagon from under a pile of stuff and pulled it across the street and up their driveway. Charlotte and her kids seemed to love the wagon at once, and it became part of their play routine. They all waved at me and thanked me when I left. And for a while, I felt good seeing them at the wagon. The gift assuaging somewhat my uneasiness about the bird bath. My feelings changed course as Newt took to showing up regularly at, the, at his house to check on its progress. He might know the wagon on site and ask where they'd gotten it. And I imagined them pointing toward our house and Newt squinting in my direction, the missing bird bath rising from his memory. Click, click, click. If Charlotte suspected me of anything, I couldn't tell it. They were friendlier to me than ever. So friendly that I could see it as a natural development that they would come over for a visit and the kids would spill out the back door to play in the yard, their mother joining them and just happening to catch a glimpse of the faux bois bird bath behind the garage. Maybe she'd think nothing of it at the time, but slowly it could come to seem familiar. And she could ask Newt to refresh her on what Olivia's bird bath had looked like. As I continued to picture Charlotte and her kids in my backyard, the thought that I'd given them the wagon unsettled me for many weeks. Had I intended at some level to expose myself? Did I want them to discover the birdbath, which could lead to a confrontation and confession to Newt? As soon as Newt and his wife moved into the renovated house, I couldn't doubt that they'd all begin to spend extra time together. And a couple of times I saw the kids pulling their wagon down the sidewalk to Newt's. I repeatedly imagined that they'd connected the wagon with the bird bath and were discussing possibilities that inevitably led to me. It became more difficult for me to put my fears aside. And I came to a realization that I could not rest unless I returned the bird bath. I decided to write Newt a letter, 
telling them how it all had happened, finding the wagon, and my mistaken assumptions about the new owners. I asked our yard crew to load the bird bath in their truck and deliver it to Newt's house, place it in the side yard, and put the envelope containing the letter under his front mat. They agreed to make the delivery, and I waited to hear something from Newt. Within a week, I received a handwritten note in which he assured me that no harm had been done, and there was no reason for me to be concerned. We'd all done things we regretted in our lives, he said, and I felt relieved reading his note. A month later, someone in the neighborhood threw a party that we and many other neighbors were invited to, including Newt and his wife. He had a slight reaction when I introduced myself, his mouth coming open, and I'm sure I blushed as I identified myself as the birdbath lifter. But once he spoke, he couldn't have been more gracious and forgiving. And I said how grateful I was that he hadn't reacted with anger. I didn't tell him how miserable I'd been, preferring not to overdo it. I was nervous facing him and kept my talk with him brief. I went on my way, a fear slowly taking hold that Newt might say something about the birdbath to Vance, who would have been put in the awkward position of asking Newt to explain what I'd done. Another worry was that Newt might not only tell the story to Vance, but repeated in the days ahead to our neighbors. He might come to see it as oddly amusing, especially if he learned that Vance hadn't heard it. And he'd probably include the part about giving Charlotte's kids the wagon. When we got home, I told Vance. I couldn't stand not to anymore. The story rattled him and he had trouble sleeping. You can't do things like that, he said. You can't know who will hear about it. I began to take my walks less frequently, but when I did, I studied the faces of neighbors I passed to see if I could detect judgment in their gazes. Vance asked why I'd cut down on my walks and why I sometimes drove to other neighborhoods to take them. I answered that my body was growing old and tired and I wanted to see different surroundings, which opened the door to another subject. Our daughter, Sarah, and her husband had recently moved to a new home in a city four hours south on the interstate. I suggested to Vance that we look for a house there so we could get, be closer to her. We'd been in our house for decades, I said, and it needed more repairs than we cared to deal with. He liked the idea. So we searched online and in under a month, we bought a place five minutes from Sarah, the first step in separating from our old neighborhood. We sold our house quickly, made the move and haven't been back since. The interstate is too dangerous. Loaded with 18 wheelers thundering forward at high speeds, swerving as they change lanes, as if threatening retribution to anyone intruding on their territory. We'd rather see new places or stay where we are than return. Though my mind does drift back to the birdbath and the question of who's heard the story and who might occasionally be telling it. I've tried to make a clean breast of it in these pages, but I now have misgivings about letting anyone else see them. Yet, concealing my account won't help resolve the episode, episode, which still lingers inside me like an itch that I can never quite reach. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. What a great story. Hey, somebody was commenting on the uh, just just the brilliant anxiety spiral that uh, was crafted in that story, and I was definitely uh, sucked into that as well. Thank you so much, Glenn. And now, our final reader of the evening. I am so delighted 
to welcome Cami Thomas. And while I do so, or before I do so, I want to remind everyone that we will have a little time for questions at the end. If you do have a question, uh, you can drop it in the chat or into the Q&A box at the bottom of our screen and be sure to let us know who your question is for or if it's for everyone. We'll get to as many as we can at the end of the evening. We're also dropping some links into the chat to purchase copies of these authors' works. Uh, these links go through the Norwich Bookstore, and we're happy, like I say, to ship books anywhere in the country or have them available for pickup if you're in our area. And please uh, do check those out. Uh, we've got some great, great words in these collections, and you'll certainly want to pick some of them up. You'll certainly want to read more. So thank you very much. And now, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our third author of the evening. It's Cami Thomas. Cami Thomas's collection, Tremors, does nothing short of trace a lifetime. These short, musical, and often humorous poems make stops in the trains of childhood, an environment of difficulty, and some violence. Middle life, the plane where parents begin breaking down and children move away into their own lives. And later life, a space in which memory falters, but passion does not. The collection is Tremors, and we are delighted to welcome Cami Thomas. Take it away, Cami. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, Sam, and also great to hear you read both Joan and Glenn. Woo, okay. Um, I have to take a moment to say that I am a lucky person to have been with Four Way for almost 20 years. Thank you, Martha. And thanks to Hannah, Ryan, Sally, and everybody for a connection, both friendly and professional. Thanks also to those who read and improved the entire manuscript. My sister, Dorothy Q. Thomas, to whom the book is dedicated, she's here tonight. She took a chaotic pile and handed me back a book. And also thanks to Alan Shapiro, who responded to my draft with a long opening comment and notes on every page in 24 hours. Thank you to Jennifer Clarvo, who has responded so thoughtfully to almost every poem and to my writing groups, thank you. And finally, thank you to my wonderful family, friends, and everybody else for showing up. I really appreciate it. This book is in three parts, uh, childhood, middle life, and later life. It's autobiographical, but with a liberal dose of poetic license. And I'll read just a few poems uh, from each section. The emotional landscape is quite varied, so feel free to laugh or cry as called upon. And uh, I'll start with the first poem. Mum, out in the world, our smiles look perfect. Inside the house, dread keeps us mum. Our smiles look perfect. The driveway is long. Dread keeps us mum. No one can hear. The driveway is long, his braided horse whip. No one can hear. Old leather frayed. His braided horse whip. We laugh at him, old leather, leather frayed under the table. We laugh at him. He grabs our legs under the table, pulled out kicking. He grabs our legs. His 10-year-old girl pulled out kicking, points the shotgun. His 10-year-old girl, no one can hear, points the shotgun. Dread keeps us mum. The Eye of the Malign. The eye of the malign is a cold blue eye that stares from the heart of every scene. It laughs when you cry and cries when you laugh like no other eye that's ever been. The symmetries of evil, little sport and big flash on the eye's cold screen. If you let it in to where you live, it will burn a hole without being seen. Sometimes it looks out from the waist of a dress on a woman in the dust, or it's on a ship too long at sea where the decking has turned to rust. Babies see it when they wake at night, if strangers come to their cries. 
horses patient in a dusky field run off if it's in the sunrise. Which way you turn doesn't matter in the end. The eye of the malign is there. It's saving grace, if grace there is, is that its gaze goes everywhere. The Thing from Another World. This is the title of a film, and it's the one from the 1950s, not the more modern one. The Thing from Another World. My brother kept a sword by his bed after he saw the thing from another world, a huge humanoid space creature frozen under the ice. Thawed by Arctic scientists, the creature broke out of a lab, tried to kill everyone. Jim said a man could crawl into our bedroom from the porch roof, so he lay awake in the next bed, ready to draw his sword. The creature had swiped a paw off a husky. Under bright lights, the paw twisted and scraped. One night, woken by a noise, Jim pulled his sword from the scabbard, snuck into the hall. Lost in the dark, determined to save us, he turned, something rising in his throat, a piercing animal scream. Our father appeared in the dark. What are you, he said, a scared little girl. But Jim knew the creature was still there, clung to his heavy sword. It wasn't easy, frozen under the ice. And in a different mood, um, I saw the movie Rocket Man, which was a biopic about Elton John, and it led to this poem, which is called Rocket Girl. I frayed my mother's temper, ran around, disobeyed, saw myself a glorious boy, tall, wild, and mild. Sometimes had to be shoved into a dress, cried pitifully. Featherless robin, fallen, I made a cotton nest in the bathroom sink, tried to feed it worms, but in the night it vanished. Maybe the cat, I was stoic. Forbidden inside on summer days, ran down green roads to lilac land, sweet perfume, purple and white, made me dizzy, lost on winding paths, waving a wooden sword, locked my mother in tangled branches, made her beg, to be let out. So that's a few from childhood. I'm going to move now to a few from middle life. The first one is called Chilling Kills. I'm a killer from my living room among my lovely things. A killer swimming in a cool pool, trying not to hurt anyone. Under my own tall trees, a killer. Everything about me kills, even in my everyday shoes, even in my cool pool. In my living room, I take it as a given. Nothing wicked comes, mowers mowing. I vacuum dust away while somehow killing. I take it as a given how clean we keep it. How wicked these chilling kills of people I don't see because I'm vacuuming. How clean we keep it, my America. How free of weeds. I'm reading one poem about each of my children. And um, this poem was um, an experiment. I was trying to write it in iambic pentameter and I was just clippity clopping along and then the topic sort of fell into the, into the meter in a way. So anyway, I hope you can hear that. And the name of the poem is This Moving Ship, Our Life. I said, I love you, darling, when Claire left with ancient suitcase, duffel full of shoes, left for a new life she could not yet see. 
I advised her where to walk, where not, which side of the street can save your life, and to be correct with everyone at work, even though she comes to deeply hate. She nodded patiently, swung one leg over the other, tucked her heavy hair behind her ears and watched the ticket window as we waited for the train. She leaned her head on my arm. Where else could she have gone? Where else could I? Was there another way to walk back to my car without imagining the unspeakable things that happen every day? When someone sat down next to her, would she pretend to read or fall asleep, head inclining toward some other shoulder? This next one is in uh, fragments. There are two different sort of narratives that are sort of interwoven. Uh, and I'll pause in between the lines so you can hear the fragmentary nature of them. Force. The leaves hid everything. I was very young. The muscular strength of men until someone which I try not to think about. I found dead wasps beneath the nest. They're pale. It was 50 years ago and I can't remember. Forced me down, pulled a knife, he. After heavy rain last weekend, the nest, tears, sweat dropping in the dirt while Heads bowed, thick antennae slicked back. Took me into the woods I hadn't realized. Paper wasps built an enormous nest. Hands like hot wrenches. Should I have? Someone had held my sister down too. Made of spit and leaves buzzing must have done it before, he knew. The wasps have gone, leaving only their dead. His face, I told myself, no man would ever. And again, in a very different mood, and a very different man. <laughs> Uh, this is the last one from the middle section. It's called August, Race Point Beach, Provincetown. We walk the shellless shore looking for a gentle slope in. Warm breeze, cold water. Two large seals cruise parallel to the beach, and I think of sharks. We go in fast, out faster, seaweed on our backs. The seals vanish. Two young men cross the dunes. Strip, submerge, stroll off. Whaleboat on the horizon. No spouts. Round blue sky. Half moon. We walk companionably, noticing each other's bodies. Today, my hip isn't aching. The bugs aren't biting him. Down the beach, two currents meet uneasily on a sandbar, rippling in an extended line. 33 years with almost no fighting. He hands me a skipping stone. And this is from the later life section. And uh, this poem is for D. And the title is a quote and you'll find out who said it in the first line. Watch out for the old cows. That's what the ranch foreman said. When they get old, they get mean. When you herd old cows, you're supposed to keep your horse away from their heads, not push them hard. Herefords have curved, sharp horns that can unseam you from groin to heart. Watch out for the old cows. Don't interrupt me when I'm eating. Don't tell me how to do things I've done for decades, like drive or think or cook a stew. 
My husband keeps a careful distance in case the horns take a wide sweep as I'm shaking off the latest invasion in my space by some political crime, some machine that breaks when I touch it, some unforgivable memory lapse I have to claim. Everything hurts, but I try to ignore it. My left psoas muscle, what even is that? And there's another medical one here. Dear heart. And Joan, I have a timpani in it. Dear heart, for decades, I vibrated to your flutter, your arrhythmic timpani. Every day I worry, wishing will not make us well. My Greek cardiologist quotes Homer, commands me to live without fear, then implants a monitor in my breast. I can't see it, but I can feel it. Wishing will not make us well. A short metal warning under the skin, clocking your syncopated beats. My friend's husband, fit in body and mind, died at 60 of a massive heart attack. Wait, he said to her. And then just two more, um, and they are pandemic poems, which you can tell because this is the title of the first one, in the fourth month of the pandemic. Up comes the huge tufted head, cocked to the side. She seems to stare at me from the top of the pine tree, round yellow eyes with thick brows, broad honey-colored chest, eases out a wing, ducks her head under, rhythmically cleaning. I want to stay until dusk, watch her lethal, silent descent on prey in the field next door. Everything must still look okay through her eyes, small me far below, pulling up my mask in the carless street. And again, I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Um, and this is the last poem and it's called Plague Reunion. And this is for my other daughter, Plague Reunion. Her voice, a violin, hair, a candle, something fierce, something small and air, brandishing a pencil. Emma's come home, middle of the night with her little dog, old stars stir, spark the big wind. As systems broke, she left her tropical isle took a plane in mask and swim goggles, dog at her feet, dark drive home in a sanitized rental, freezing air conditioning, speeders all around cutting her off. When she stood at the foot of the stairs, our feet crept forward, but our heads hung back. We couldn't hug her. Shucking her shoes, she arrived cheerful, headed for bed, her dog, Hazy, waving his white flag. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cami. So much applause in the chat. And thank you, uh, Glenn Porsche, Joan Houlihan. We're so grateful to have all of you here tonight. And uh, I, I loved, uh, Cammie, the range of emotions in, in your poetry truly does uh, trace a lifetime. Um, I think that, that was such an apt description of this work. I've posted links in the chat uh, to all three of these books and uh, Hannah at Four Way Books has also been busy in the chat uh, posting those links. Thanks, Hannah, you're quick, I like it. Um, do go ahead and hit those. If you're interested in more of these authors work, uh, you can also of course visit Four Way Books. We've got a link in the chat to them. And uh, 
you can help support Four Ways Mission and their continued publishing project. Uh, there's more information about that on their website as well. And of course, uh, buying books supports authors, supports bookstores, and supports the press. So uh, we're grateful for that. I wondered, we have just a couple of minutes left, um, so I won't take too much of your time, but I wondered if each of you could tell us uh, if there's anything you're working on now or what is next for each of you. We'll, we'll go in the same order we went in before. Uh, Joan, Ulan, do you have something in the pipeline? Something coming up? Yeah, I have a, a couple of things. Um, working on two sets of things, really. One I would characterize as memoir-like, but not a memoir. I think it's episodic and probably leaning towards prose. So that's happening. And then on the other side, um, working on poetry that um, is a sort of an off offshoot in terms of looking at, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if you know, the Swedish poet, uh, Anne's Berg, she, she really moved me and I, I started keying off of a lot of her titles and using those titles as my titles and writing poems toward, like answers toward her poems. So that's happening. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm always writing, I guess, you know, like Liam Rector used to say, I always be closing, I think I'll always be writing. I feel I have to, well, Liam Rector got that from obviously <laughs> Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, but uh, I feel like I have to be writing or else I'm not really alive, so. I guess that's a deep uh, way to say it, but it's true. Yeah, it's who I am. So I'm, I'm writing, yeah. Indeed, Glenn, what are you working on next? Well, I'm always writing stories, I'm gathering a new collection of stories and these stories are shorter. Most of the work I'm doing now is uh, under 2000 word stories. So um, I'm getting a collection of short shorts together, together to submit. I, for one, cannot wait to see that. Cammie Thomas, what about you? What are you working on now? You know, I love this period when the, a book is about to come out or has just come out because it just feels like a wild time to me where I can do whatever I want. I don't feel the press as the years go by to kind of make something happen. Instead, I just feel very free. And so I'm writing poems, I guess you could call them. They're kind of way out there in the wild and I'm just trying to go with that and have as much fun as possible before I have to start taking it all more seriously. It would be good to never take it so seriously. Um, so this is a this is a halcyon moment. This moment of it's it's a moment of incipience. And I just mm. love that. It's really mm. so yeah more poems, more poems. Mm. We hope. Thank you. More poems all the time. Although uh, in the in the chat, Cami, I will just tell you that Martha reminds you you have a uh, thirty book contract now with all the books due <laughs> next month. So get get working on that. Oops. No <laughs> problem, Martha. No, <laughs> you may all, all three of you may need to sign that one. I I don't know. Maybe you got lost in your inboxes or something like that. I don't know. It's, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much to all three of you. And thank you to everyone out there that this chat uh, I am just watching is uh, such a place of joy this evening and uh, so much gratitude for your work um, for all three of you. Uh, love for this, for, for, for uh, this writing, for this storytelling um, and for the ways that it brings us together, even over Zoom, uh, which, you know, like, like, like we said before, is nice in its own way because it allows us all to be together from disparate places. Mm -hmm. We are so grateful to have all of you here and uh, someone in the chat says, thank God for poets. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, and for small presses and for great writing generally. Well, and thanks so for grateful. hosting us. Thank you so much for thank you. putting this on thank for you. us. Yeah. And Great to read to with both of you, Cammie and Glenn. Yes. Nice, thanks. nice, really nice reading. And thank you to yes. Four Way Books. Yeah, thank thanks you. to Four Way, of course. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Raise a glass to Four Way Books. Uh, again, you are tuned in with the Norwich Bookstore tonight. We are in Norwich, Vermont. Check us out if you're in the area or check us out online, norwichbookstore.com. We ship 
Uh, we are on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, follow along with us. We sure, There's sure to be something else happening with us that you will enjoy. And do check out Four Way Books, follow their social media, get on their newsletter, see how you can support their work uh, because they really are doing some amazing stuff. And thank you to all three of tonight's authors. And wherever you're joining us from tonight, be safe, be well, read good books, take care of each other. We really are all in this together. And we're so grateful that you spent your Friday night with us. Tonight, we've been with Joan Houlihan, with Glenn Porcho and Cami Thomas. Thanks to all of you. And thanks to everyone out there. Good night and have a wonderful weekend. Good night. Thank good night. you. Thank thanks you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.